I've been an activist for over 10 years and sometimes you do become, um, you know, sometimes there's feelings of isolation. So my name is Andrew Radzik, uh, R-A-D-Z-I-K, and I'm the Outreach Director at the Wilderness Committee. All right, my name is Mike Balko. I'm with Enjoy, uh, the Environmental Justice Organizing Initiative, and we wanted to pick a name that wasn't apocalyptic. Well, it's the accumulating and compounding effects of climate change are building. They're being felt in some parts of the world more than in others. I think they're being felt in BC more than in other parts of Canada, for example. In the past 100 years, coastal temperatures in BC have risen by about 0.6 degrees, while the interior has warmed by more than one degree, twice the rate of the global average. That if, metaphorically, if we imagine what the scientists are telling us about climate change, it's like looking off the coast, maybe looking at the radar and seeing the hurricane approaching. And even though it's approaching and lots of the impacts are being forecast to us, people in a way don't believe it. And lots of people are not going to believe it until it actually touches down and touches them. To a concept like climate change, um, it seems pretty abstract uh, to a lot of people. And I guess because it's looking at things in a holistic way, which we're not maybe socially really doing at this point in time. Uh, it's pretty obvious to see when you're a First Nations person in your traditional territory, the impacts that climate change is having and the impacts that other environmental crises are having in your traditional territory. It's also easy to see when you're a, a low-income person in, in, in some place like the Lower Mainland. You're seeing transit challenges, right, where you're getting passed by on buses because the buses are full. Communities working towards and kind of developing a movement around climate change, I think we really need to look at um, factors of inequity that are inherent in the current system that we're in. Um, because I think that really prevents people from um, engaging in that discourse. Because if you're focused on meeting some of your more immediate needs, it's really more of a challenge, or it's just sometimes you don't even have the time or the opportunity to really think about those broader conditions. So we want to make sure that um, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're putting forward solutions that work for communities as a whole. Uh, you know, changing your light bulb is just not going to do it, and we know that. It's, it's ridiculous to even tell people, like, this is the way forward on climate change. The way forward is going to be larger solutions. We have to start looking at stuff like, you know, jobs for communities that don't have jobs and, and ones that specifically help, not just ones that aren't as environmentally unfriendly as they have in the past, but ones that actually make the world a better place. What does a green job really look like, and how do we bring them to the communities that need them? Uh, the most important thing that we can do to really make a difference on climate change, to really make a difference on, on social justice, to really make the world a better place, is allowing people within their communities to make those decisions for themselves. Uh, you know, the, the people always talk about wanting to impact, you know, in the environmental community people talk a lot about wanting to impact the decision makers. You know, you want to change this or that politician's mind. My long-term goal is to see every individual person become a decision maker, become the kind of person who decides what's happening in their community, in their province, in their country, and eventually around their planet. Well, um, the purpose was to bring together uh, people from communities that are traditionally left out of the environmental conversation and left out of the conversation around climate change. Even though many of us were strangers with one another, there was a comfortable and safe feeling almost immediately. After the group set up social guidelines, The thin ice was broken, the gates opened, and the sea of energy, passion, and emotion came through. The desire to work together to have momentum. And there's, there is a presence of spirituality in the room always. 
very easily accessed and is really uh, what people want to have and what needs to be at the foundation of the work, at the heart of the work. Um, is the incredible strength that exists between our mothers, our fathers, and that firstborn child. Out of our connection to the sacredness of Mother Earth gets so damaged, you know? And what that, that, that framework was, was the movement for environmental justice. One of the workshops was Andrea's presentation of Global View Climate Change Impacts, which talks about climate change and how it is impacting our planet and that immediate change needs to occur in order to prevent our marvelous blue planet from turning black. We're all sort of sitting around and we're starting from the outside, we went from the outside in, like what is the hurricane drawing in to help Earth? We hear we had a whole conversation about a hurricane using the hurricane as a metaphor for talking about social movements and it came out of a comment that I heard one participant make about uh, hurricanes a beautiful teacher and I think the hurricanes a good metaphor both for the impacts of climate change what's useful about the metaphor is the idea that this is building lots of people want to see a social movement and they expect that that somehow means seeing something tomorrow that they haven't seen now but understanding that it's a kind of a pressure a kind of a capacity that has to accumulate and build. So I think the hurricane is good for that. It was a really unique and rare experience when talking about something that tends to be really fact-based and intellectual, such as climate change, and really to be able to shift that to more of our emotional and um, spiritual-based responses, including the facts and all of the intellectual aspects and integrating um, ideas of community and social justice into that as well. You know, we want to make sure that we're sharing skills, we're sharing uh, tools, we're sharing tactics and strategies so we can be more effective in our communities, giving our communities the tools they need. To social environmental change needs to happen in unison. To many, social and environmental justice is a different issue. In reality, they function in a very symbiotic way. For example, the devastating conditions that Hurricane Katrina left the people of the Gulf Coast in 2005. Katrina started as a Category 1, grew to a Category 3, and quickly escalated in 9 hours to a Category 5 due to unusual warm waters. Warm waters, some might say due to global warming, caused by mostly human actions. So, we damage our delicate climate balance. The planet hurts, therefore we hurt. So this is just an example of how environmental and social conditions are intertwined with one another. But with all storms, they always end. Things always appear bleak before they get better. The sun will always shine through. The horizon will rise and ignite promising thoughts and hopes of a positive future. Uh, thinking globally, acting locally, and as cliched as that sounds, it is something that resonates and it's, it's something that really goes back to the heart of what we're trying to do. The, the, the small ripple that becomes the big wave because it's going to take a huge wave of all of us pushing together. Energy of the people, the power and the force of the people as it becomes more focused around this, uh, will become an unmantled force and will bring about great change. So after me and Mark participated, observed, interviewed and spoken with the various players of the enjoying training, we left with a sense of brewing change on the horizon.